Milestone Sunday. It's an incredible day where we as a community of believers join with the parents of the grade 5 and grade 12 students to celebrate their moving on from one phase of ministry and life to the next. In all our celebrations this morning, our main objective is to delight in what God is doing in and through the lives of His children. A special day like today not only reminds us of how much we need one another, but it particularly reminds us of how much we need God. Over the past number of months, we've been experiencing an unprecedented world event and it has changed us. The COVID-19 disruption to our regular routines has altered how we function as a church. It has caused many of us to re-examine our patterns and question many of the whys of what we do. Even now, as things begin to open up and our province resumes some normal activities, life is different, things have changed. However, regardless of the disruptions and changes, as followers of Jesus, we can be confident of this. God loves us deeply. He cares passionately about us and provides for all of our needs. And as we celebrate Milestone Sunday today, we can be sure of His goodness in the lives of these beautifully and wonderfully created children and youth. As scripture tells us in Numbers 6, verse 24 to 26, God is good. He blesses us and protects us. He smiles on us and is gracious to us. God shows us His favor and gives us His peace. Our vision at Clearview Church is to equip everyone to take a next step in following Jesus Christ. That everyone includes children and youth, and so from the time that kids come here, we always want them to know that they are loved and belong. And we, as the body of believers, ministry leaders, and volunteers, join parents in doing everything we can to help them grow in faith. In a few minutes, both Christy and Patty are going to be sharing some particulars about the ministries that they lead and give us a sneak peek into how and why we partner with parents in the building of faith of kids. Before we do, however, please join me in praying for this Milestone Sunday. Dear Lord our God, Father, Creator, Savior and Friend, Comforter and Sustainer, we welcome you this morning and ask for your blessing on this service. As we celebrate what you've been doing in the lives of these children and youth, we give you praise for what you have done and for what you will continue to do. We pray and ask that you continue to guide them along right paths for the sake of your name. By your Spirit's power, you have used us, parents, ministry leaders, friends, fellow followers of Christ, to encourage, guide, and lead these children and youth. And to you we give all the glory due your holy name. Your goodness and unfailing love pursue us all the days of our lives, and we give you thanks. And so, whether we are young or old, in grade 5 or 12, we ask that you help us to dwell in your house forever. Bless this service as we celebrate these amazing kids. We thank you, Jesus. Amen. Hi, I'm Christy, the Director of Children's Ministry here at Clearview Church. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me, said John, one of the Clearview kids, as his brown hair fell down his face. His hands on his lap, he joined the chorus of children and Clearview kids saying, Jesus died on the cross for me. Please forgive me of all my sins. Then finally, he prayed with a smile, Jesus, be my best friend. 
All but two children put up their hands on a Sunday morning to indicate that Jesus is their best friend. That was about three months ago here at Clearview Kids. Around that time, I had a conversation with lead pastor Eric. Eric pointed out that we the church are yellow and the family is red, put together makes orange. That is the curriculum we're using here at Clearview Church for the children in Clearview Kids grades one to five. It's called Orange. The same week, a child in the Clearview Kids ministry said they wanted a Bible. Since we did a Bible challenge for the congregation on the book of John, the importance of scripture was forefront in our minds. Through prayer, God placed it on my heart to buy Bibles for each child and give families a challenge, a Bible reading challenge. This will be incredible for families, said one observer, as the brand new order just for them Bibles were given to each child. When the children got the Bibles with amazing illustrations of scripture in it, one child grasped, wow, look at this, as he opened the Bible and showed it to his mother. Thank you, she said to a children's leader. Children and parents were also given a list of questions to answer, along with the Bible challenge, in order to help children reflect on scripture and have a chance to process what the scripture reading means to them. When asked, what is the favorite thing that you've learned about God during this Bible reading time? Little Sasha in grade four said, that no matter what, he loves you just the way you are. As I shared the news of Sasha's spiritual journey over the Bible reading time with a leader in Clearview Kids, the leader said something very profound. She said, it was asked of a spiritual theologian at one point in his life, what is the most important thing that you've learned over all the years of your life being a Bible scholar? The man said the most important thing that he learned was, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Thank you, Sasha, for reminding us that God loves us and that indeed his Bible tells us so. I spoke to another mother of a child in Clearview Kids who got one of the Bibles. The mother said that her child was not ever keen on reading scripture. No matter what she did, he wouldn't read the word. Then she got the Bible from Clearview Church. Her child, Matt, started to devour this Bible. He said, can I please do the next section of reading? All he wanted to do was keep reading the word. Praise God. We here at Clearview Kids value scripture being embedded in the lives of children. Our number one goal is to see children grow in faith and in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And it's powerful to build one's faith and next steps with Jesus through reading his word. His word really is a lamp unto our feet. And here at Clearview, we enjoy Clearview Kids each Sunday. Clearview Kids, what exactly is it you might ask? It's a ministry for children grades one to five. These school-aged children are taught biblical truths. We use the orange curriculum, as I mentioned, and we use it for the first time this year, and it went great. Using orange, children learn three main things. One, I can trust God. Two, I can make wise decisions with God. And three, how to treat others the way I want to be treated. Children were taught by many different leaders here at Clearview, all of whom are appreciated very much. The scripture, Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man, Luke 2, 5, 2, is the backbone of learning here at Clearview Kids. We want our children to grow in wisdom and in stature, finding favor with God and with man. It's amazing this morning to celebrate what God has been doing in the lives of these children. Events like this remind us of how much we need each other and how God has worked in our lives through people. As a church, we recognize that we partner with parents in the faith formation of their children. The church being yellow and the home being red, to when combined makes orange, an influence of home and church working together, making the impact so much stronger than it would be if we worked alone. On that note, children who are in grade five now will be moving on from Clearview Kids into youth next year. So we've asked parents to read an important scripture over their child, an encouragement, a blessing from one generation to the other as the children pass from one milestone to the next. So please join me as we watch these videos together of parents reading scripture over the grade fives that are graduating here at Clearview Church. This is a verse that we put down on Paige's baby announcement when she was born and the words still hold true today. It's Psalm 139, verse 13 to 14, reading from the New International Version. For you created my inmost being. 
You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Psalm 62, verse 5 to 8. Yes, my soul finds rest in God. My hope comes from Him. Truly He is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depends on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in Him at all yeah. times, your people. Pour out your heart to Him, for God is our refuge. Uh, no, the verse that we've chosen for you is Deuteronomy 31, verse 6. Which says, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Ryan, a reading from 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. So go forth in God's love. Good morning, my name is Patty Sherman, and I'm the youth director here at Clearview. As a church family, we have watched our young kids, some of them babies, grow up into young men and women. We've been part of their life through clubs, events, and just seeing them on Sunday mornings. Today, we're celebrating the grade 12 youth whose stage of life is shifting. For some, a distinctly new environment marks the beginning of a significant change. For some, there are new schedules within a similar setting as in the past year. Grade 12s. Wherever you are on this continuum, the backdrop remains the same. You are children of the Heavenly Father. Levi, Rachel, Conrad, Matt, Eric, Brandon, and Stefan. You are loved, you are known, you are cared for, and you are blessed by the God of the universe. Allow me to introduce the great twelves to you. After that time, a youth leader will be praying for them for whatever lies before them in the fall. Let me tell you about Levi. Levi currently attends and will be graduating from Iroquois Ridge High School. He participated on serve, cadets, nursery, and has helped with Sunday morning sound for worship services. Levi is enrolled at Ryerson University and will be taking film studies. He is considerate, hardworking, intelligent, and appreciates deep friendships. The Bible passage selected for you, Levi, comes from Ecclesiastes. It is a good book of the Old Testament to wrestle and reflect on the wise words of King Solomon. Here is Ecclesiastes 11 verse 5. Just as you cannot understand the path of the wind or the mystery of a tiny baby growing in its mother's womb, so you cannot understand the activity of God who does all things. Rachel Dehouge. Rachel has been attending Iroquois Ridge High School. Rachel was in GEMS and she participated in three summer serve projects in Michigan, London, and Hamilton. Rachel enjoys cake decorating and in her spare time during COVID-19, she's been painting rocks for the neighborhood. She's excited to be accepted at Western University where she will be studying symbol engineering. Rachel is a hockey player, she shows commitment, and she makes time for people. Rachel is easy to talk with. She's unassuming and will try new things on her own. The Bible passage chosen specifically for you, Rach, comes from 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4 to 7. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy, it does not post, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Conrad Gardner goes to White Oak Secondary School. He has loved kids camp during the summers, kids ministry, serve, and dot. Dot, by the way, is dinner on Thorsby, where we get to have the grade 12s every other Tuesday for an evening. This fall, Conrad is working, and at the moment he is undecided, but his interests lie in business and law. Conrad is conversational. He's interesting, he enjoys video games, he's helpful with his siblings, he's a great driver, loves his little car, he's good with building and helps his dad with his new house. The verse that comes to mind for you, Conrad, comes from Colossians 4, verse 5 to 6. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Matt Groot. 
Matt is graduating from Toronto District Christian High School. He has been involved in cadets from grades 4 to 8, and he has been a cadet counselor from grades 9 through 12. He helps with the video at church, nursery, and is a participant at youth, at serve, and the AOIC. Matt plans to apprentice in a trade, and although his field is unknown, his prayer is to ask God to show him which trade. Matt loves to chat. He is hardworking. He's committed to a project. He's excellent with building and creating. He loves adventure and the outdoors and enjoys chilling with friends. Matt, you have a deep respect and honor for good people. The Bible passage chosen for you comes from Romans 12, verse 10 to 12a. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope. Eric Schultz will be graduating from Oakville Trafalgar High School. He's been on serve and the AOYC. Eric is really happy that he's been accepted at Carleton University to study computer science honors and algorithms. Eric is intelligent and he's set on a goal. He's also a rugby player. Eric, you're going to be working long hours, but remember to look up and look around. Here's a well-known passage in Luke 10, verse 26 to 27, that addresses your emotions, your mind, and the people with whom you are in contact. It says, teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? The answer, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Brandon Van Leer. He will be graduating from King's Christian Collegiate. Brandon has been involved in jump, cadets, kids camp as a participant and a leader, serve, nursery, junior and senior youth, as well as DOT. He loves sports, especially basketball. He is mature, down to earth, and kind to others. Brandon has a good head on his shoulders, and his prayer is to stay focused in his studies. Whenever you doubt or wonder about God's love for you, Brandon, lean into Romans 8, verse 38 to 39. I am convinced that nothing can separate us from love, God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today or worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below, indeed nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. And Stefan van Niekerk. Stefan went to Oakville Trafalgar High School. He's been on serve, AOYC, video tech team, nursery, as well as youth. Stefan is excited to be starting at the University of Guelph in the mathematical science program and plans to play for the Griffins varsity rugby team. He loves rugby and hanging out with his friends. He's willing to chat and share stories. He has a great sense of humor and a discussion. There are a lot of good comments and insights that he will slide right in there. Stefan in Psalm 27, like Sorry, Psalm 27, verse 3, like King David, seek God. It's kind of like a rugby match. Seek God. And remember, though a mighty army surrounds me, my heart will not be afraid. Even if I am attacked, I will remain confident. Levi, Rachel, Conrad, Matt, Eric, Brandon, and Stefan, you are part of a family, one body, one church. This church, this church, clear of you, cares deeply for each and every one of you. This is not goodbye, but this is a reminder that you are part of a family. Remember, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. I'm going to be praying for Levi. Let us pray. Dear Father God in heaven, thank you for Levi. Thank you that you have been with him over all his school years. Thank you for the ways that you have blessed him, and then in turn, how he blesses us. Thank you for his thoughtful heart and how he thinks of others. Thank you for his outgoing personality, his inquisitive mind, his creative brain, and his sense of humor. Thank you that he is able to use these gifts as he enters Ryerson University for film studies. Be with him and give him boldness and courage to face challenges Continue to help him to stand strong and true and be passionate for what he believes. Father God, help Levi to know that Clearview is another home for him with people who love him dearly. Father God, be a lamp for his feet, 
a light to his path. Shine over him and fill him with your spirit. Our Father, our God, we come before you and um, we thank you for Rachel. We thank you for um, allowing us to get to know her over the past years. Her heart for others shines and uh, so evidently on serve trips too. Keep that growing in her, Lord. We pray for Rachel's next chapter as she studies at Western University. What excitement. We pray over that. Protect her and guide her and allow her to always feel and know how great your love for her is. Dear Heavenly Father, this is the time of the year that we as youth leaders are both excited and sad. This is the time that we get to pray over the youth that we have come to know over the last seven years as they get ready to graduate. It has been a privilege to see Conrad Garter grow into a fine young adult and to see him grow spiritually. It was a pleasure to join him on serve trips and to see his compassion and willingness to help those that we were serving. I pray for Conrad as he starts his next chapter in his life. And I pray that you continue to remind him that you are always there beside him. Lord, as this chapter closes and another eagerly awaits, pave his road with opportunities to live with hope in this incredible journey called life. I also pray that Conrad knows that his church community and I will be there for him in prayer and support. Conrad, may God bless you as you continue your journey with him. Father, you have set a plan for each of our lives, even before we were a thought in our parents' minds. You know where each of our paths lead, and I pray that we continue to follow it. Thank you that Matt has followed the path that you set for his life. He is a strong, resilient, hardworking young man who has chosen to honor the gift that you've given him by working with his hands in the trades. Lord, I pray that over the next year, Matt can further discover the path that you have set for him. In Proverbs, it says, point your kids in the right direction. When they're old, they won't be lost. I pray that over the next year, you continue to reveal the plans that you have for him. Lead Matt in the direction that you have chosen for him. Heavenly Father, thank you for young men and women who have trusted in Lord Jesus as their savior. Lord, I ask that you will continue to work in Eric's life as your child. I pray that Eric will find others at the university who have who you have drawn closer to you and have made a commitment to you. Bless Eric and help him to grow in grace and in knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. May he continue to walk in spirit and in truth and to trust you in your word, Lord, knowing that your grace is sufficient for all his needs and requirements. Please keep him from being influenced by the temptations and from the enemy who seek to disrupt his walk with God. Eric, uh, Jesus spoke these words while knowing that his earthly life was coming to an end. And we know that in our lives and your life at school, you will face some tough times. Please hear Jesus' words for you, Eric, from John 16, 33. Here on earth, Eric, you will have many trials and sorrows. But take heart because I, that is Jesus, have overcome the world. Dear Lord, Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your child, Brandon Van Lair. Thank you for his willingness to be involved in a variety of things over the years, things like helping out with nursery, going to serve, growing his faith during cadets, kids ministry and youth group. We thank you for his thoughtful and loving family and his circle of friends and small group. As a church family, we've watched him grow up and certainly grow taller over the years. From a talkative toddler to a mature young man, a playful teenager and a kind-hearted youth. Brandon demonstrates wisdom, friendliness, and pure happiness when playing basketball or enjoying a new pair of shoes. Dear Jesus, continue to hold him tightly in the palm of your hand so that whether he is starting his course this fall at Laureate in his home or meeting new people online, whether he is challenged by his business courses or examining his faith in a new setting, remind him that he is never alone. He is fearfully and wonderfully made and neither fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow can separate us from God's love. And please remind him that we at Clearview care very much for him and together love and serve the almighty King and God, a faithful friend and savior and the compassionate comforter and Holy Spirit. Dear Lord, I pray for Stefan. As we celebrate this milestone in an unusual time, thank you for walking alongside Stefan in his last year of high school and the decisions he had to make for the next part of his journey. 
You have blessed Stefan with many wonderful gifts and talents. One is his love for math, which has led him to the decision to attend the University of Guelph for a degree in mathematical sciences. As he studies towards his future career, Lord, please make his heart and spirit open to every plan and purpose you have for him. You have created him with a natural talent for sports, whether it is competing in gymnastics for Oakville, playing basketball every Sunday night at youth, creating a physical challenge just because there's nothing else to do, or in September, playing for the Griffin Varsity Rugby Team at Guelph. However rugby looks in September, I pray for your powerful protection over Stefan, that you will watch his path, protect him, and keep him safe. It appears the start of university will not be the norm for these graduates, but Lord, I pray that Stefan's transition will be smooth and that the leaders in charge will have answers to every possible scenario. I pray that you guide him in his decision of residence as well as any other options the fall brings. No matter what September looks like, Holy Spirit, I pray that you grant Stefan the wisdom and direction in making the necessary decisions. Give, give Stefan peace to any worry or anxiety in this next phase. Fill him with strength, courage, and confidence to face each new experience. Lord, you have also placed good friends in his life. May you continue to surround Stefan with friends that support and challenge him to press closer to you. Lord, I speak for some of us when I say we love his ability to be silly and make us laugh. May he continue to live with a sense of joy, adventure, and expectation in all that you have in store for him. Please allow these gifts you have placed inside his life to grow, develop, and flourish to bring you glory. May Stefan know that he is loved by you, his youth leaders, the extended Clearview family, and that he will be dearly missed. In your name we pray. Amen. For the time when I lost my job, I couldn't provide for my family, for myself, needed a hot meal. For the time when everything fell apart, I got my diagnosis, struggled with depression and loneliness. I was lost. For the time when we lost our home, my mom worked two jobs, couldn't afford after school care. For the time when I first came to Canada, needed help with my homework to learn a new language, I needed a friend. For the time when I gained perspective, volunteered, mentored, listened. I became part of a community. For the time when I found help. For the times when you need us, Kerr Street Mission is there. Good morning, Clearview. My name is Mike Reinders, and I'm here to introduce the offering opportunities today. One of them is to support our own Clearview Church, where without the various net rental incomes that we normally have, we still have bills and salaries to pay. The other offering opportunity is for Kerr Street Mission. I serve as a director on the board of Kerr Street Mission, and I volunteer there as well. Kerr Street Mission is located in a multi-purpose building on Kerr Street just south of Spears Road in a poor area of Oakville known as Kerr Street Village. As we at Clearview learn and practice more about the art of neighboring, organizations like Kerr Street Mission have been serving neighbors in Oakville for many years. Did you know that here in affluent Oakville over 20,000 people live below the poverty line and maybe more now with the pandemic issues? Kerr Street Mission provides care for low-income and at-risk families and youth. By coming alongside families in distress and help, helping them get to a healthier, more sustainable solution. And by developing youth so they don't end up in poverty. There are many programs uh, at Kerr Street Mission, including after-school programs for kids and youth, summer programs, youth drop-in, uh, food market, community meals that are served. Uh, prenatal nutrition programs, and the Neighborhood Care Network, and that is where Clearview is directly connected. Heather Matt at Clearview leads this area of ministry in our church. We actually have several people in our church trained and supported by Kerr Street Mission's Neighborhood Care Network to serve in our local Clearview area. The idea is that Kerr Street Mission strives to engage and enable the local churches in Oakville to take care of neighborhood issues instead of sending people elsewhere, like to Kerr Street. However, due to the COVID pandemic, most of the programs at 
uh, Kerr Street have been put on pause, except for the food program. It is all the more needed at this time. It is an essential service here in Oakville. Food is being distributed six days a week. There have been many long lines and busy days. And of course, modifications had to be made based on the restrictions that have been imposed. One of the recent exciting developments has been the opportunity to open up summer day camp again at Kerr Street. Halton Region is going to allow summer day camps with extensive guidelines, so plans are now progressing to make that happen. Kerr Street Mission thanks you for being a loving neighbor. Good morning. It's uh, June 14th, and um, this is our second Sunday in the uh, in the Art of Neighboring series. Today we're going to be looking at barriers to neighboring, and our scripture passage for this morning is Luke chapter 10, verses 38 to 42. And I'm going to be reading from the New American Standard. Now, as they were traveling along, he entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister called Mary, who was seated at the Lord's feet, listening to his words. But Martha was distracted with all her preparations, and she came up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Tell her to help me. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things, but only one thing is necessary, for Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. May God give us understanding as we seek to know him better. It's been quite a week. Some things have opened up and things are starting to open up around all the COVID stuff. And, uh, and we're not quite sure where it's all going to go, but it's provoked a new phase of conversation. Um, just this week, our staff group had the first meeting that we've had together face to face in, gee, in since mid-March, April, May, June, almost three months. And um, it was really great to see each other and to be together again. I really, I realized again how much in this time I've missed that face-to-face -face connection with people. And um, they, of course that puts me in mind of all the things that I'm missing. Um, I'm missing Oh, hugs, of course, and, and, and I'm missing just, just being able to go for a coffee with someone, just being able to, to go to a bar and sit in a bar and have a pint and just talk, just hang out with somebody that, I'm, that I care about. I, I do remember, I remember going to bars and I remember one of the things that always happened if I went to a bar with somebody to have a uh, have a beer or something and and um if they were sitting i, I couldn't sit if they were, if there was a tv right behind them I i'd be doing this i'd be talking to them and then i'd be kind of like wandering up like that and then i'd come back and i'd kind of focus on them again and then i'd kind of be distracted and wandering up into that field of view if there was a tv in my field of view it was it was not much uh not much good i wasn't much good company and I'm trying to keep my attention on them, but I keep getting pulled away. I need to sit with my back to a TV if I'm in a place like that. Lots of places like that, well, that's not po well, <laughs> it's not possible to sit anywhere in them right yet. But, but when we did, I remember that. I remember getting distracted. Oh, I'd still love to be able to just go and get distracted with somebody. But that's the thing about distraction, right? Distraction is what pulls us away from something that's more important. Now, when I'm with somebody, that, that person is more important to me than anything else. But that's what makes the TV distracting. It's something that's less important that is nonetheless pulling my attention away, pulling me away from them. Something that 
that it's a lot of trouble for me to compete with. But, but distraction is by definition getting pulled away from something that is more important by something that is less important. That's the nature of distraction, right? We get distracted from something that's important, like talking to you, to something that's not so important, like the noise of that helicopter. It's distracting. It's hard for me to focus on what I'm doing right now. And he's gonna go right over my head. You see what I mean? Now, being distracted from something, by definition, it's being distracted from something that's more important to something that's less important. I mean, if someone heads off on a trip and, and they turn off their phone and they put it in their bag and they leave it there, we don't say that they were distracted from text messaging by their driving. We've come to recognize that driving is more important. And we, we encourage, we legislate, we require people to put their phones away so they won't be distracted from what's more important. And certainly anybody who's been involved in a car accident or something that's banged into the back end of somebody, or worse, they realize right away that their driving was more important than that phone, than that text. I think it's really interesting that they use um, the word distracted to describe what's going on with Martha. She is distracted by all the things that she has to do. That's what it says in the story. She's distracted by all the preparations. And she comes to Jesus and, and says, you know, tell Mary to help me. Now there's two things that we need to consider just to kind of set it in context here for, for this story. This was a, a culture where hospitality was hugely important. It was very important. Um, Martha had invited Jesus to her home along with his disciples. I don't know how many of them there would have been. I mean, there were the 12, but he had just finished sending out 72 disciples and they'd all come back. There was the, then this exchange of where he tells the story of the Good Samaritan and then this is the story that immediately follows. So if they're in close succession, it could be quite a house full of people that she's got. And hospitality was a, a very important part of their culture. To invite someone to your home and to feed them, you were, you were honoring them, but then they were honoring you by their presence. It was, there was a lot of, a lot of expectation put around, around this kind of thing of, of inviting someone to your home and feeding them. And so there was a huge desire to do this very well in order to show more honor. And the other piece that's in this story that needs to be acknowledged because it's different, again, from maybe our culture in some ways, there's a gender piece that needs to be, at least be nodded to. Um, Mary was sitting at Jesus' feet. Jesus would have been surrounded probably by his disciples and he would have been speaking and teaching and there would have probably been lots of discussion and argument and questions and, and lots of debate back and forth and, and she was just soaking all of this in. She was, she was really enjoying this and she was learning from it. But that's not something that was done. That, that was a breach of social protocol because in their culture there were very clear de de definings, very clear separations, sorry, between what men did and what women did. And women did not, in their culture, sit at the rabbi's feet and study and learn with the rabbi. That was something that was reserved for the men. And so for Jesus to allow this, and to encourage it, there's this breach in social etiquette. There's this breach in protocol, this breach in expectations. There's, there's all of this happening, plus it's throwing this added burden onto Martha. Martha quite reasonably assumed that Jesus would support telling Mary to fulfill her obligations. That's what Martha is thinking. Fulfill your obligations. You have a 
family obligation, you have an obligation as a woman in this house to prepare the food. And, and this story illustrates part, partly for us Jesus' attitude toward women, Jesus' attitude toward uh, the, and, and, and his way of, of, of upheaving the social expectations that were there. And his encouragement for Mary to stay and to sit with all of the others and to learn at his feet and to be part of that whole discussion and that teaching. Now, where this story occurs is important, I think, too. This story comes at the end of chapter 10. At the beginning of chapter 10, Jesus has sent out the 72. He's done a couple of things there that are important and just want to keep them in mind. He's told them, you go into the villages in pairs and you don't take anything with you. You don't take any money, don't take a purse, don't take an extra coat, don't take any extra shoes, don't just go in there. And all you bring with you is peace. You bring the peace of the kingdom and you you say, peace be upon this house, and you stay and you receive whatever hospitality they offer you. And you don't go house to house looking for a better deal or anything like that. You, you, you stay there. He's teaching them to be present. He's underlining that, to be present. The story that follows immediately is related Jesus is immediately asked by the, by the teacher of the religious law, well, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What, you know, do I have to go and do all these things too? Well, Jesus says, what does the law tell you? Love God with all your heart and body and mind and soul and love your neighbor as you love yourself. Jesus says, well, good, sounds good, go do that. Well, who's my neighbor, he asks, meaning to justify himself. And Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan is another story that underlines this importance of being present, of making time and being present. And then it's lived out again, immediately following in the next story. The importance when we are with people, when we are discovering what it is to be a neighbor, when we are when we are investing ourselves in the kingdom of God, the two things that become barriers to that are time and presence. Time and a lack of presence. Um, you can, I think, I, and I think it was true in their culture, but I think it was true in our culture in a different way. We have a different attitude toward time. We have a much more problematic attitude toward time than what they had in, in Jesus' culture. But I think the issues are similar. They get played out in a different way. In their culture, there were gender divisions that, that put very strict uh, uh, expectations on time. In our culture, it's a little different, a little. But in our culture, we do something, we commodify time. We turn it into a commodity. We turn it into something. We, we talk about, how do you spend your time? What do you spend your time doing, you know? We talk about spending our time like it's something that we have in our wallet and that we have a limited amount of time and we kind of parse it out. Jesus was teaching his disciples the art of presence, the art of being present in the presence of one another and in the presence of God when they were with others, that, that they were receiving the presence of God in others. We think of time as this thing that we parse out in days or hours or minutes or seconds. I mean, we, in this in 2020, in southern Ontario, we live in the most time-obsessed culture 
in the history of the world. 200 years ago, they rarely measured things out in hours. Most people didn't have clocks. I mean, I sit up in my office and, and, um, and I'm surrounded by clocks. I sit at my desk. There's a clock just over on this side of my desk, if I'm sitting at my desk. There's a clock here. There's a clock on the landline telephone. There's a clock on my cell phone. There's a clock on my iPod. There's even a clock on the computer, just on the top right part of the screen. There's five clocks in my field of view as I sit at my desk. If I look around the room where my office is and, and our bedroom on the other side, there's another three clocks over there. There's clocks on the nightstands. There's clocks on my Kindle. There's, there's a clock on, my, on our DVD player. If I go through the house, there are clocks in every room. Every room, multiple clocks in every room. The only room in our house that doesn't have a clock in it is the bathroom. And when I go in there, I take my phone out. We're so consumed with time in our culture. It's, it seeps into how we do everything. Our work, our families, our, our daily routine. And this is how one of the things that has been really disrupted in this time, in this weird era that we're living through of being locked down and people being out of work or having their work schedules completely disrupted, our whole daily routines are completely disrupted. How many of us have had the feeling that we don't know what day it is or we don't know what time it is? It's like perpetually being on vacation only, not very restful. And so we have all these things that distract us. We're distracted by, by our activities with our kids and by Netflix and chores and laundry and getting the gardening done and home improvements and Netflix and HBO and Crave and BritBox and email and Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. We have more distractions in our world than ever. We're distracted from being present. We're time obsessed. And one of the things about time, one of the things about focusing on time, is that even though we're measuring, a clock will measure the time it is at this moment, what it does is it propels us into the future, to obsessing about the future and how we're spending our time and how time is running out. And I think Jesus was trying to help his disciples not be so concerned, or maybe trying to help us not be so concerned with spending our time so much as he is wanting us to make time. Make time making time for each other, making time to just be together and recognizing that being present with somebody will take time. You can't schedule a lot of that. You can't make that happen on a calendar or within a certain time frame. And so, When Martha was so distracted with all those preparations, she was doing a lot. And there was nothing wrong with what she was doing. She wanted it to be good. She wanted to show honor. And she wanted to give something to Jesus and to his disciples. And there was nothing wrong with what she wanted. But she also wanted that because one of the things about doing things for other people is that we kind of control and manage things. It's one of the problems that we have in the church. We do a lot of things for a lot of people. We control and manage all kinds of programs for all kinds of people. 
And we also, well, we tend to run our churches kind of like businesses. And we can't do all of those things and do them being present. It's harder. We end up at cross purposes with what God is calling us to do and to be. Our dealings with people then start to become transactional, more like customer service and less like family relationships. A significant barrier is that there just isn't enough time. Of course, there's the same amount of time, but there isn't enough time to do that. We need to slow down. And one of the things that has happened because of this pandemic is that for many of us, not for all of us, I recognize for many of us it's placed greater strain in our lives, for some of us, but for many of us, it's created these spaces of time that are not filled and structured the same way they were. And I'm not suggesting that we just add more things to fill up that time. That's an impulse that we all have. But that we make a commitment to make that time for people. That we make a commitment that that time is going to be for getting to know our neighbors. That we make time, not spend it, not spend it like it's something that's depleting and diminishing and we're running out of and that propels us to live in, anticip in anticipation of the future, but to be present, which is what needed to happen in all three of those stories. When Jesus sent his disciples into the towns, he was sending them with nothing. And he said, I'm sending you like like lambs among the wolves, you need to go and just be present and you will see the kingdom of God. When the man was lying for dead on the side of the road, he needed somebody who would come and just be present, just see him for who he is. And the priest went by and the Levite went by and they, they, they weren't present. They were off heading where they were heading. And it was the Samaritan who was present, to be present and to receive. And so it is with Mary. We need to learn from Mary. We need to learn to let go of the expectations and choose something that is more valuable. And what Jesus is trying to say is more valuable is being present to each other. And that's going, that's going to rearrange our schedules. It's gonna rearrange the expectations that we have. It's gonna bring us into conflict with social expectations. It's gonna bring us into conflict with things that people in our families expect from us. Things that other people that are close to us, things that people in our church family expect of us and in the structures and institutions of our church expect from us. It's going, it's going to create an opportunity. It's going to create an opportunity for just what happened when the 72 went out. They came in contact with the kingdom of God. When the Samaritan looked on the man on the side of the road, he came in contact with the with the kingdom of God. And when Mary sat at Jesus' feet, she touched the kingdom of God and it wouldn't be taken from her. I know that for myself, I have people in my life who are very old and I'm only just beginning to appreciate the people, the seniors that I have who have lived a long time and they have a different attitude and perspective around time. They're not so concerned with spending their time. They're very aware, yes, of maybe of the limit of time that they have. 
but they can be present and they can teach me to be present. I remember one of them saying to me, God has always been present to me, always watching over me, but I wasn't always present with God. God was there whether I was asleep or awake, whether I was distracted by silly, useless, silly, useless things or distracted by very important, useless things. Whether we are aware of God or not, God is always aware of us and wants to be present to us. And when we are present to others, in our family, or in our neighborhood, or to the person that we encounter on the street, or in whatever action we're in, we create an opportunity for the kingdom of God to be there. But we must be present in that moment, like Mary. And when we are, well, we won't be distracted by all those things that pull us away by many things, but what we are drawn to will not be taken away from us. Amen. Your family and your children and 
And so we pray for the continued presence of God, the unearnable favor of the Father of us all. It will never leave you. The challenge of Jesus Christ as he reorders the priorities of our lives will lead us forward to do things we never thought possible. The courage and strength of the Holy Spirit will hold us present, always present in this moment when the kingdom of God is revealed right in front of us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.